Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Atlantic Institute's Self-Sufficiency. This is a program. This is our second class. We have with us today Scott, and he is going to introduce himself. Um, we are recording now, and I'm going to um, ask you guys if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, and then I'll read them to Scott. And if um, he might need you to put his hand up and stuff like that. So, Scott, just so you know, I know you're going to speak, but we already had um, can you homestead in five acres or less question come up. So just keep ah, that in mind oh, good. Um, as you mm. give your presentation, because I know, oh, let me go ahead and make you um, co-host again. <clears throat> so you can go ahead and share your screen and um, take it away. There you go. All right. Hello. Hey, my man Jeff is on here. I just met yesterday. His uh right there, man. I'm gonna mention you actually in a little bit because man, I had I just hung out with Jeff last night on a on a uh new his friend just bought some land and uh oops, I'm gonna sign in. And we went and did a property walkabout on his property last night. And I had so much fun. That's one of my favorite things to do. And I'm excited to be with y'all today for people from all over the world. I didn't really know what to expect. So here we go. This is, I'm going to slide you guys over here. I'll be presenting an introduction to Treehouse Trade School's online curriculum called Homesteading Simplified. And the goal with this course, so this is a this is a, a ten part, uh, long term, in depth course, and the goal of it is to help you save thirty to a hundred thousand dollars on the development of your homestead. Today's presentation is an introduction, so hopefully you'll be able to glean some information where you can get started and uh, just begin to get some inspiration and a little bit of some ideas of things that you have to look at and through the development of your homestead. And uh, love seeing your faces, love seeing any questions and things that come up too. So I'll introduce myself. My name is Scott Allen Bunn. I am, I've been building homes since I was, I'm gonna minimize, there you go. I've been building homes since I was 11 years old. I'm now 40. I'm a third generation trades teacher. My father and my grandfather were both teachers and tradesmen. Um, I just found out yesterday, actually, my great, great grandfather was a cabinet maker as well. So it's been in my family for quite some time. Co-founded the Seneca Treehouse Project, which is a 1.1 acre homestead. And actually, the majority of that is on four tenths of an acre. So yes, you can homestead on a very small piece of land. It is also a permaculture learning center and Airbnb in the upstate of South Carolina. Um, side note, a lot of people call me extra, but as my man Jeff here told me last night, when you're extra, you get more. So today, uh, if I overwhelm you with information, I'm sorry. But uh, my goal is to get a lot of stuff out there in a little bit of time. So, you know, this is being recorded. Go back and review it, and uh, there'll be some more stuff you can get. So right now I'm working on founding Treehouse Trade School. I've been working on this for several years. It's a regenerative development company, and we are a uh, we do full-scale homestead development, general contracting, we do educational workshops and online training, and we do a whole bunch of custom design build projects like furniture, fixtures, housing, like things that nobody else wants to mess with. We'll get into it. We do permaculture design and installation, uh, and our goal is to become the world's number one resource for homestead development and education. We are creating a magic formula as a curriculum to help people master the trades within the realm of homestead development. I'm going to define a homestead in a minute uh, to, to kind of simplify that. I also uh, author of 71 Solutions. This is my book right here. 
I'm going to go over a couple things in that book through this presentation. And I'm a single father of Abel and Miles. Those are the two guys in this picture. Together, we call ourselves Sam Bunn, Scott, Abel, and Miles. And we're working on creating The Adventures of Miles and Abel, which is a children's book series. Uh, it's about learning about natural and man-made ecological systems. So as I take them on uh, trips and we go on uh, vacations, we're going to visit, like last summer we did rivers, lakes, and ocean, and we learned about uh, the water systems. So what is a homestead? Can I get a show of hands uh, for the people or throw it in the chat? How many people would already consider themselves a homesteader to some degree? All right, I got some some little bits maybe. All right, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will all be able to consider yourself a level one at minimum homesteader. So I've defined a homestead. Uh, this is my own definition. So a residence that provides for its inhabitants or further defined a residence that provides regeneration for its inhabitants. We're looking at all seven layers of sustainability. And those seven layers I outline in 71 solutions. Those are sustenance, looking at food, water, and medicine. Shelter, considering also clothing, housing, and any protection from the elements. Community, including you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, church groups, etc. Ecology, which is living in a way that is uh, leaving the planet better than we found it, essentially. Uh, energy, all kinds of energy needed for lights, for fuel for your car, to uh, heat your food, propane, uh, et cetera. We're looking at economy and system of governance. So economy is producing money and system of governance uh, to help keep things organized and uh, efficient. So when we, well, if we look at our standard American dwelling, or as I like to call it, SAD, we have homes that are constantly requiring money. We have to go to work like 50% <laughs> On average, I think 50% of our money earned is going towards our home. And if we look at we're having to work for our food, we have to work for uh, to provide to buy the house. And then if you own a house, you have to maintain the house. We have to buy the energy and uh, just pretty much buying every single thing that we need. And so back in 2008, we were strictly building custom homes. And I was building like, this was, so 2008, the uh, mortgage industry crashed, right? And the, prior to that, we were building the highest end custom home we had ever built. And it was a multi-million dollar uh, like the client was like, yeah, let's just do that. Let's do that. I, I want, yeah, sure. Do that. And then all of a sudden, well, I went to work and the client was like, Hey, uh, I can't get any money from the bank. So we're done building this. And I can't pay you the $80,000 that I currently owe you. So we left with, uh, our tails between our legs and I went home, I had just finished building a sad of my own. And I was like, what just happened? I did not realize that the economy would crash every eight to 12 years. And I asked my grandmother, she was 70 years old at the time. She was like, yeah, it's probably crashed about seven, seven times in my life. And I was like, man, that happens like on a regular basis. And I was fresh out of college, so I didn't know any better. 
So at that point, I started turning my sad into uh, a homestead. And I'm trying to come up with an acronym for happy. I haven't figured it out yet. Happy homestead. I don't know. We'll figure that out. But we're making the sad into a happy. So this is our happy right here. This is Treehouse Trade School's home base. It's a 1.1 acre homestead. It's called the Seneca Treehouse Project. And we, we got the name because we built a treehouse in the backyard for fun. And this is the this is the sad right here, standard American dwelling. I just I built it for a workshop and a house, and, uh, and then the economy tanked, and I started renting out rooms. And I moved into. Can you all see my mouse? Yeah. Okay. I moved into this lakeside cabin, and uh, lived in that. It's kind of a, a tiny house, five hundred fifty square foot thing. And then I ended up. Like because this property is mostly covered in driveway, house, and trees, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, food production opportunity. So I actually started homesteading on other people's land, OPL or OPP, other people's property. This land right here belonged to my neighbors, and I asked them, I was like, "Hey, can I put in a garden?" I said, "Sure." So I started gardening over here where it now says food forest. And she said, you know, I would like to rebuild my house and my dock. And uh, maybe you guys could do that in exchange for the land. So I did um, about $40,000 worth of work for a $10,000 piece of property. And I learned about bartering and uh, how to stand my ground and value myself. Uh, but I got it through barter system. And then we started doing i learned about permaculture and now we have chickens so this is all what you're looking at here in the middle is four tenths of an acre and we have a food forest we have um we have a uh there's an earth bag structure down here vegetable garden this is a geodesic dome this is where i live right now there's a yurt there's a greenhouse and then there's a whole section up here that's like a uh food forest for the chickens, essentially. So quite, where'd you guys go? Quite a bit of stuff going on. And uh, and you can do it with less and you can do it without owning your own property. You can get started on the balcony of your apartment, um, you know, to actually start producing something for you and your family can uh, start with in a potted, you know, in some pots. So uh, you don't have to go out and buy 20 acres and a bunch of barns and all that. All right. So any questions so far? Do I need to slow down? All right. No, so no, you're doing good. I thought that geodesic dome was going to be a um, greenhouse type of thing. But now oh. I'm like, oh, now you live in it. Now that's intriguing me even more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so self-sufficient versus sustainable versus resilient. A lot of people, um, you know, kind of greenwash the word sustainable, but uh, some people think, well, I don't want to sustain what we're what we've been doing because that's not working and we're we're declining. So um, we use that word sometimes. Self-sufficient is uh, what we're kind of moving towards. But if we think about self-sufficient on in terms of ourselves providing everything that we need with the modern day necessities, we're never going to be fully self-sufficient as an individual because we use technology. I like sugar, you know, I like avocados and, and pineapples, uh, right? So I'm not gonna produce all that stuff in temperate zone of South Carolina. Um, we could be self-sufficient as a community of people, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a, a community of people living, uh, living together, if we were to give up on a lot of technology, you know, it'd be a lot easier to be self-sufficient, but if we're trying to produce everything that we need by ourselves, it's actually usually less sustainable because 
like I've been doing for years, running around trying to do everything. And then things are degrading because I can't keep up with them. So it's really about building resilience as a community of people so that we're working together and we don't have to rebuild everything. It's just uh, modifying what we have largely. And um, and if we do start from scratch, start, start off um, a little bit with more design in mind. All right, so I'm gonna blow through a lot of uh, content here and I'm gonna try to move fast because I, I wanna get, get through this. And, um, and then I try not to overshoot my time. And uh, Christina, if you need to, if you need to stop me, just- I'll let you know, okay. I'll let you know. All right, so I gotta re, how did I do this? Um, there we go. All right. So these are the 10 elements of homesteading to consider. I, this is the online class that I've been building and I'm still actually working on it. So if you guys think there are some things that I missed, please let me know. Um, the purpose of this is to simplify the process as much as possible, but homesteading is not a simple thing. If you're looking at all elements, we're thinking about Property, um, pro personal and property assessment. So that's number one, looking at all things the property has to offer, all things that you and your family, like if you're married, you and your spouse have to come together and agree. Um, things considering all life moving through the land, uh, through the property over time as your kids grow up and get older and move out and maybe your parents move in, um, you know, things that will change over time. So uh, part two is the low maintenance garden mindset. All these I'm going to expand on. Uh, In-depth introduction to permaculture. Anybody know about permaculture already? Okay. No, I was going to say one of the questions down there was what is permaculture? So Awesome. I'm going to go through that more here in a minute. So great. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, minimalist toolkit is... Um, Looking at the tools, if you want to DIY a lot of your own construction projects, gardening projects, kind of the minimal, reasonable tools necessary. Uh, looking at home positioning and other building positioning for energy efficiency. How to earn income on your homestead so that you can rebuild things when needed without having to rely on additional income sources, outside in some income sources. Uh, then we're looking at easy meat and egg production. Uh, if you if you want meat and eggs, and then uh, energy production, building materials, and governance and automation. All right, so I'm going to expand all that on all of that here in a second. All right, so the first part. Section one is the assessments. Through this assessment process, you really want to think about all the skills, like what skills you have and what skills you need to learn or to hire out. And, and I recommend you know having a notebook just for taking notes for today, where you have like one page on each one of these sections and you're like, just think about it as as time unfolds. You don't have to figure it all out right now, but think about the things that you're going to need. Uh, who's on your team? That could be people like uh, your family, could be your friends that want to learn stuff. We have a lot of people that say, hey, let me know when you're doing this. I want to learn. And if you know, you got to have a way to keep track of those people so you can text them and let them all know when you're doing something. We're looking at property assessment, which is actually quite a bit to consider. Um, like last night, I walked around with Jeff and uh, and Al, and we were just geeking out over all the things. I mean, trees are a resource. Also, there was a bunch of uh, tires from the previous landowner on this property. And I said, hey, you know, that's actually a building material if you want to use it. 
So a lot of things available um, that you could use. I've built uh, retaining walls on people's properties and I paid $6,000 to bring in all these big boulders. And I walked around their property and I found a massive pile of boulders. And I was like, hey, we could have just used these. And they were like, what? You know, so you can save a lot. And you see why I say in this process, you can save thirty dollars to $100,000 pretty easily if you go through this process and you look at the resources you have available. With uh, Also with the property assessment, you can look at... Uh, there are a lot of different apps you can use for mapping and learning about the contours, the lay of the land, where the water flows, uh, learning where the, the wind's coming from, uh, the wildlife, and carefully observing that. And then uh, if you have invasive species, um, applying permaculture, which we'll go into more here in a second, and then your dreams, goals, plan, strategy, tactics. So start with dreams, create goals. Then from the goals, create a plan, with, which includes a strategy and it, specific tactics, things that you can do to just pick away at it one thing at a time, then executing it, reflecting, and repeating. That's a very good outline. For that. Um, yeah. One one person before we get off the, the land section, she was wondering, do you offer assistance with the land purchasing process? Yes. Yeah. So we have a we have a full scale like we can uh, provide consultation. We uh, well, I'll I'll go do walkabouts with people before they buy land. I just did one with my friend uh, Trad Cotter, who's a my mycologist. Some of you might know about him. He's uh, he's looking for land right now and. I went and walk walk property with him, looked at the house and crawl underneath the house. Um, yeah, so we can do anything from uh, we can provide education, we can do consultation, we can do it with you, uh, we can do it for you. Uh, so any any realm. I was going to say some people don't realize if the if the water if the property slopes like where you want to put your garden at, it helps to know where water is going to run, where you want to, your garden, stuff like that. It's very important to come into play. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The backdrop of this picture right here that we're looking at is uh, we have a swale that runs. I'm actually, the picture, I'm standing right in the middle of the swale looking out and all these trees have grown so rapidly uh, because of the utilization of water. So that's actually the next thing. Low maintenance garden mindset section two. And in that picture, that's a beehive, right? There's a beehive there, yeah. That's, okay. that's what I thought. Yeah. So in this section, we're talking about changing the way you think about things. Because for me, like I, I've grown up in America. I grew up excited to, to learn how to drive the lawnmower. When I was little, I was like, yeah, hey, I can finally mow the grass. And then I spent all, a whole bunch of time driving around on the lawnmower, mowing the grass. And uh, so this is about changing the way we think about things to help busy people build resilience. I personally do not have a lot of time to garden. So for me, I don't spend very much time in the garden. I uh, implement and integrate things that are extremely low maintenance and productive, come back year after year and get better and stronger. So with the standard landscape, we have mowing every week or two in the summertime, which we pay for the mower, we pay for the fuel, we, you know, uh, maintain it. We buy and spray weed killer, which is often killing the things that are really good for us. Um, we rake grass, we bag up leaves, we haul them away. And then we go out, we buy our fertilizer and buy our mulch <laughs> and buy our groceries. And then we also, with the standard landscape, we're trying to get rid of the water, funnel it out, get it out to the ocean as quickly as possible. But with the low maintenance garden mindset, um, if you're okay with it, you can mow a lot less. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, you might have more critters, but with uh, where, where they're 
where you're trying to produce more life. Like you're trying to, in the home study process, you're trying to produce more living systems. Where there is life, there will be life. So you're going to have more life. You're going to have more critters. And it's just learning about integrating things together to uh, create a balance. So in the low maintenance garden, you're going to um, you be introduced to tool sharing. We don't all have to own a lawnmower. Maybe you still want to do like want to mow your grass. We don't all have to have a lawnmower that we use for one hour every two weeks. You know, we can share resources. Uh, learning how to eat the weeds. Uh, compost everything organic. Grow tasty food and flowers. Uh, capture, filter, store, and use water. Consistently building healthy soil, just passively building soil. Uh, using integrated pest and disease management. And then some people stress out because they have too much fruit. They're like, oh my gosh, I can't harvest it all. You know? So don't, you know, harvest what you can and let the rest of it fall to the ground. And... Uh oh, my um, speaker just died on my, my Bluetooth speaker. Oh, I was going to say, I can still hear you. I saw a glitch at the top. I thought maybe something else. Hold on a second. Um, I was just going to say, I figured I would just tell you all. It was interesting. One year, we our lawnmower died. We have two acres, and our, our right on lawnmower died. So we actually borrowed a friend's, like he was saying tool sharing we used a friends and we shared we went back and forth with the lawnmower and so we traded different things with the lawnmower because because you know what we're in northeast georgia and summer i mean we only really mow the lawn eight times maybe the whole year so it was kind of like well what do we even need one for like sharing this is kind of working out good so we actually did do that for one year then we actually found two a friend of ours gave us gave us a platform for a mower and another friend had the engine and all the components for it so we actually put both of those together and built uh a nice lawnmower i forgot it's the john deere actually and we actually put it together and built built a lawnmower out of two frankensteins it costs like five hundred dollars it helps okay. just because we're blessed that we have this knowledge to be able to do that stuff hey i'm uh, give me one second. I can't hear yep. anything right now. I'm sorry. I got I got to log back in with my phone so I can get audio. Cause no problem. I'm gonna have to do audio on my phone, my Bluetooth. Just that's the joy of technology. Let me mute. Yeah, you're gonna get reverb. Um, yes, and actually, CO, I did try dandelion tea last year. I, I, we went and picked, we had a ton of dandelions. And so I had the kids, we all went up and picked them all, and I tried dandelion tea, and it was, I thought, I don't know how people do this, because this is quite, it tasted like dirt. It was quite, quite bitter, quite. And then I know I can make dandelion jam or jelly, and I thought, I don't know if I want to do that yet, because that was, that was quite the experience. But one of the things that I've been trying to do this year is get more into the foraging and learning what the things are outside that we can eat and make a salad from and things like that. So it was quite interesting. But Daniel, I thought maybe I should try that again. I don't know. How do I know some random dog didn't pee on some dandelion and I picked it and I, you know, so it was kind of like, hmm, let's make sure maybe we should do that again. So your computer is muted, I think, and your phone. Scott, is your phone? Yeah, there we go. I got it. There we go. All right, I got I got audio on one device and video on another, buddy. Yep. Um, no problem. Yeah, if you go to look at uh, hey Scott, I'm still here. What's that? I'm still here, Scott. Oh, right on, man, right on. If you look at uh, herbicide, at like go to Lowe's and look at herbicide, it says kills weeds and at least three of those weeds are are edible 
And it's like dandelion and onions and chick chickweed, which are all edible and delicious. So are you guys still getting reverb or no? I don't think so. Jennifer says uh, first time hearing about foraging. Yeah, actually, there was somebody here. I was trying to see if they could do a class and put together a salad for us all to have first, because I said I, I would like a little bit more information on what I can actually eat and put put it together first. Let me just see it all in a bowl and eat it. And then I'm like, I think I feel like I can then find it because we get those purple violet flowers out here that are low lying. And everybody said you can also pick those and make a a jam or something out of those like those are edible as well and i'm like i feel like i just need a little bit more i need somebody to walk around here with me and go this is edible that's not edible this is edible that's not yeah, yeah. i just need like yeah that's awesome all right are we ready um yep. and is the sound okay you have a little bit of a high pitch something after you speak but i it's fine if you want to just keep going how about that? That's probably, yep, that's good. Okay, cool. I have my, com my computer speakers broken. And it's just like this little annoying thing that's happened. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, oops, dang it. All right. Low maintenance garden mindset. That's section two. I'm going to go on to the next thing real quick. An in-depth introduction to permaculture. Permaculture is a nature mimicry design approach. It was uh, created by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, and it was intended to be a permanent agriculture system at first, and then they created a textbook, and it still is intended to be permanent agriculture, but it also... If you apply the principles of permaculture, you can apply it to anything, your business, your family, your operation, uh, your community. So we do an in-depth introduction to permaculture. We also have a permaculture certification course. And once you get that certification, you can um, you can start making money. Well, we actually will need to be, uh, probably this year, we'll probably need to hire a permaculture cert uh, certified designer to uh, mimic or to take my place because I, I can't keep up with it. And Jeff, I was thinking about you with that last night. Jeff and I were looking at all this water flow and he was seeing it. He was loving it. And uh, I was like, man, I, I think Jeff might, uh, Jeffrey might be into that. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at some of this because I love it so much. So this here, if you Google permaculture, principles, you'll find this. And I highly recommend printing this thing out and then go around this circle. These are the 12 permaculture principles. Go around and just look. And uh, each one of them, they're pretty much self-explanatory, but there's a book you can uh, get by David Holmgren's book. You can get that expands on each one of them. But uh, for instance, observe first, then interact. Observe the land through all seasons, then start interacting. Because if you start doing things before you observe all seasons, you might be cutting out a, a keystone food source for wildlife or or yourself. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to make more work for yourself if you don't do that. So print this out, hang it on your wall, put it in your notebook and just look at it and see uh, how you can apply it to your land and to your family, to your business, to your operations, etc. And then, of course, permaculture is founded on three ethics care for earth, care for people, and return the surplus. Permaculture is a pattern understanding, pattern mimicry or biomimicry. We've been doing this uh, since the beginning of mankind, but here's some key examples Velcro comes from these little burrs, suction cups, octopus and a frog, and airplanes from birds. So we can mimic these patterns and expand upon that pattern mimicry. We can consistently get more and more efficient. 
Was there an author's name? Vastina, um, living by Vastina, was asking, what's the author's name again? Oh, um, so Bill Mollison has uh, recently passed away. He's uh, He has the, uh, there's several books that they've created together, uh, Permaculture 1 and 2, and then there's uh, the Permaculture Designer's Manual. That's if you take the course, it's a textbook. That's by Bill Mollison. And then David Holmgren, H-O-L, M G R E N, I think, is the um, as one of the other the other guy. His stuff's a little bit harder to read, but uh, very intelligent, very well put together. Uh, so, this is a pattern mimicry. Uh, this is a farm. Let's see whose farm is this. Mark Shepherd's farm, um, 106 acre food forest. Uh, Mark Shepard has a great book. I uh, forget the name of it now, but I learned a lot from him. Uh, I I call this, it's like God's fingerprint. If you want to look at it, here's a fingerprint. This is contours of the land. And here's when you start working with the contours. Uh, you're moving water and, and collecting nutrients. And then you end up with uh, something that looks like a fingerprint. And... Uh, there's a lot, you know, that's, this is permaculture designed farm on a hundred acres. All right, another, all right, another uh, pattern mimicry here. This is a cancer cell. This is a human settlement on the planet. Cancer cell, humans. <laughs> all right, so doesn't have to, there's something to consider. It doesn't have to be a negative impact. It could be a positive impact if we if we make it so. But we can turn the problem into the solution um, through implementing permaculture. Permaculture is also about stacking functions, making every element try to serve two or three functions. Um, so this this is an example of a wet conveyance system where. A house has a gutter. Gutter captures water through a PVC pipe that's glued together, transporting water up, well, seemingly uphill. But if you look at this level line, it's actually slightly downhill from where the water goes into the gutter. As long as this is a solid pipe glued together all the way down, this water can be deposited at an elevation that can be then overflowed into uh, swales and berms, uh, feeding your trees, uh, producing fish uh, and aquatic plants, and it could even be a geothermal cooling device for your home. Uh, it could be a swimming pool. So this is an example. This pond right here would be an example of stacking multiple functions. So you have food production, geothermal cooling, water storage, beautification, joy, all in one element. All right, so now we have the minimalist toolkit. This is section four, learning how to use tools. And again, this can be a lot of stuff, right? But this is why we do this course over a long period of time and, and spread it out a little bit. Learning the basic tools so that you can build, this is a minimalist, reasonable tools to build just about anything. These tools I carry around with me in my truck. They could fit in the back seat of a car or trunk of a car. And if you have these tools, you can build just about anything. I just replaced my minimalist toolkit because it was stolen and I had to buy everything new. I, it was $5,000 worth of tools. If you are not doing it full time like I do. Uh, you don't need to own it all. Again, you can have a tool library or tool sharing program, or maybe you can go in with some friends and uh, buy these tools. You can often find them used at, um, you know, at a market, farmers market, or a you know, a jockey lot like we have here. But we go through these tools and show you how to use them. This is a battery toolkit. Um, we have some simple garden tools like this broad fork and a variety of other things. We have a lot of plumbing electrical tools, um, 
um, paint and finishing tools, uh, mechanical tools, and and then once you learn how to use them, I mean, there's only a couple of like power tools in there, but once you learn how to use those tools, you can literally build, I mean, a whole entire an entire house, you know, fencing, barns, whatever you need to create, chicken coops. Very empowering. And, and I have learned that you are better off with the battery recharging toolkits a lot of times, like the tool, because you can you can get up high with the saw and cut something and you can i mean we've had ones on cords we've had you know we have multiple different kinds but i've learned that getting the ones that just charge up and that you use the batteries on really tend to be the easiest to work with because you can take them anywhere yeah i mean they, you can build they, something they, way out in the back without having to run power cords all the way through and then one cord gets disconnected someone stepped on it and it just throws off the hole. Yeah. Yeah. The only time we really use the electric cords is if we're doing a lot of cutting all at once or cutting some thick, uh, you know, some oak or something like that. We'll pull out the electric stuff. But most of the time we're using battery, battery stuff. I mean, if we're framing a house, we're going to get out the electric tools and plug it all in. Uh, section five is home positioning. All right. This right here, this picture itself can save you this can save you thirty thousand dollars worth of energy production or it's energy consumption rather uh just by building your house this way and this this is uh forget what page this is but oh i opened right to it man 55 Page 55, I just scanned this in this morning, uh, so it's not the easiest thing to read, but it's page 55, passive heating and 71 solutions. Um, but if you position your home in a way that depends on where you are in the globe, where we are at our current latitude, these lines, this line here is the uh, summer solstice afternoon sunlight. That's June 20th. This line is the winter solstice afternoon sunlight. Uh, that is um, December 21st through 25th. Now, with the winter sunlight in our region, we want to try to get some sunlight into the house heat the house, but we want to block out the summer sunlight from coming into the house. When I first built my house, I put a bunch of west facing windows on a big flat side of the house. And that's a terrible idea. Because all that west facing sunlight blasts in and heats the house up. Now my heating bill might be $100 more a month. Okay, so let's look at that real quick mathematically. Let's just say it's $50 a month times 12 months times how long are you going to be on your homestead? 30 years, maybe? That's $18,000 because you didn't position the house right. And there's a lot of things to consider. Um, you can have living roofs, you can bury uh, part of your house into the ground so you're utilizing geothermal energy without having to install a $20,000 system. Um, you can uh, do rainwater collection. Um, you can put deciduous vines like right here where they grow up and as soon as it starts to heat up, the, the vines leaf out and block out the sunlight and as soon as it starts to cool off, they lose their leaves and let sunlight into the house, seasonally appropriate. You can integrate uh, water in the right spot. If you put a pond in our region, if you put a pond on the west side of the house, it's a terrible idea because the sunlight, summer sunlight would reflect off of that pond and heat up the house. So now you have the direct sun and the sun off the water heating the house when you don't want it to. But if you put it on the south side of the house, then you get dual sunlight 
coming directly in and reflecting off the water, heating the house, creating beautification and passive heating. So screenshot this bad boy. Um, you can, I'll move this out of the way. And um, of course you can get the book and look at it, but um, this can save a lot if you do it well. Any questions there? All right, so one of the questions, Eric said, what's the summer solstice degree? I think it's 80, I think for our region, I believe it's 83, 80, 83, I think it's 83 degrees, but there's a um, solar azimuth uh, website that you can go into. It's a sun locator. I, I got to Google it and find it again, but you can go in and enter your uh, latitude and it'll tell you the summer sol summer and the winter solstice angles. So those angles are going to change depending on where you are in the world. So Interesting. And how many of us would actually know where to find what our latitude is? I guess we Google that on our show, not our map. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was Google going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it should uh, <laughs> Google Maps should tell you, or you could just pull up the old the old globe and look at it. The old globe, <laughs> look at it. Remember those? <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I, I, you know, there's so much I think that's lost when we've gained technology and, and our knowledge of who we are and our earthness and humanness. I think there's yeah. just so much that like, I don't know, how would I find my latitude angle? I have no clue, you know? Um, and it's stuff that we should know, I feel like. So um, Vasina was saying, is it a good idea to invest in a solar powered system? Example, EcoFlow. Um, so EcoFlow, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with EcoFlow system itself, but it depends on where you are. Um, a, a little bit of research, looking at your sun availability in your region, like we're, we're in a great spot for sun here. So in South Carolina, solar is a good option. There are a lot of, um, with, this, with the energy companies, there are a lot of regulations that make it um, not as financially beneficial. However, if the power goes out, you if you have some solar, you can at least keep your refrigerators on, keep your food from spoiling, um, and you can keep some basic lights going. Uh, so, I mean... I, I don't have solar yet, but I plan to. Um, I've built the structures to house the solar, and um, I will have minimal, uh, some uh, 10K worth of solar on each um, structure. But... Yeah, I think we, we, had, we thought we might just do something like that ourselves, even, because some of these companies are not, they charge a heck of a lot for that or something. So it was like, maybe it's just something we can figure out how to do ourselves. Um, so... Real quick, um, Vasina also asked, where can we purchase your book? I don't know if you want to stick a link in the chat, if you want to do that now or at the end. And then oh. CO said they got a Blue Eddy brand, just a small one. Blue Eddy? Um, Blue Eddy, B-L-U-E-T-T-I brand. So I'm guessing that's a solar, that's a solar one. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that either, but yeah. um, there's see, there's I'm, a I'm lot happy. of brands out. Yes, it is. It's a small solar one. They said um, yeah. it's for traveling or camping. Uh, so it's a, it's a small one and for traveling or camping because we even discussed not putting it on the roof anymore because apparently that's not sometimes you know I where I live in Hart, near Hartwell, Georgia, and I will tell you we were out in Elberton the other day and we passed a massive solar um, up like farm, the solar energy farm. We've had, all of a sudden we're like, where the heck did that come from? I mean, it was a good 15 acres or so of just solar panels. It's quite interesting to see because we don't have that stuff around here yet. You know, so it was quite interesting. Yeah. All right, I'll let you keep going. I think you're good to keep going if, if we're, I think we're good to keep going if you are, because I think there's a lot more questions and people wanting to know stuff, just so you know, okay. Scott. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, this is, I know we're getting close on time and we're like halfway through the, you know, yeah. of and stuff. You're good. you guys want me to keep going or you're going to shut up? Okay. <laughs> I, think, um, I think you're good to keep going, yeah. Cool. 
All right. If you do want to get a copy of the book, just Am Amazon is fine. I mean, I you can go to lulu.com and we get a little bit more of the proceeds from Lulu. Uh, lulu.com will have a, have it available, uh, but you can get it from any major uh, source. I have an ebook available on the website, but I'm um, I had somebody do some rebranding, and I'm not I'm not too satisfied with it. So I would go with the print book. The print this is a workbook too, so you can like go through. And it'll ask questions, give you space to write things out, you know, and uh, so it's a good good way to reflect. I don't like all that digital stuff. All right. I found the link in Amazon, so I'm going to stick it in here. Thanks. Um, all right, so now we're looking at earning income on your homestead. So again, if we if we just build a house. You know, the thing about, I do construction and permaculture. When you build a house, it's the nicest it will ever be. When you're, this last, you know, coat of paint you put on, that's the nicest it'll ever be. And then entropy starts degrading the house. The paint wears out, you know, things, you know, God forbid water gets in somewhere and it rots or termite, you know, it's like constantly having to put energy into it. But with living systems and permaculture, it looks very minimal when you first like do the installation and then it just keeps getting better and better and better. So, you know, you can, um, you have to, when having a home, creating uh, some income somewhere in order to keep the house maintained as a necessity. So the best way we've done that is heads in the beds with Airbnb, HipCamp, VRBO, Booking.com. We've also had residents and uh, things like that, but really the best thing for us has been Airbnb. It's um, it's the greatest income, minimalist, minimal impact, and a great opportunity for people to come and uh, be. Some people don't even know where they're going. They're just looking for a place to stay, and they get there, and they're like, oh, this is awesome. I can learn about homesteading and permaculture. And then some people come and stay with us because they want, they already know what we're doing and they want to learn more and experience a small scale homestead. Um, so uh, grow produce, you can grow cut flowers. Those are two easy and kind of fun things to do. Um, you can do tours and retreats. And uh, we've done almost, I think we've done all, yeah, we've done all of these things on here. Uh, nursery where once you develop plants, it's real easy to take cuttings and start new plants. Um, and you can sell those plants. Uh, timber production, where you, know, you can, uh, like uh, Jeffrey and I were walking around last night looking at this uh, pine forest where you could selectively harvest some pine trees or some whatever trees you have growing without clear cutting the land. And you could selectively harvest forest and um, produce timber. And you can use that timber to replace things on your house as needed, siding or roofing even, or, uh, you know, rotten stuff. Uh, you can create soaps, salves, and other value-added culinary products. Uh, then you can do workshops. Once you learn stuff and become confident with the uh, skills that you're learning, then you can start bringing people in and uh, teaching others. And then, of course, you can create all kinds of crafts with things produced from your homestead. And we always uh, recommend and, and really promote the uh, benefit corporation model, which is doing, so we looked at the ethics of permaculture earlier, which are people, planet, harmony. Benefit corporation looks at impact on people, positive impact on people, positive impact on the planet, and creating a surplus, creating folks creating your own income. So you're looking at a triple bottom line business model where normal businesses look at the single bottom line profit and they don't care about anything else. And that's why we have so many degraded systems. So I urge you, if you're not familiar with it, look for when you go to uh, buy products, look for this label, the B, benefit, the B, Benefit certified, it's the best certification you can get 
because it does an in-depth assessment. If you actually have that benefit certification, you've gone through an in-depth process that looks at all aspects of your business and uh, and they, they test you on it and you have to get a certain score. We've been through that benefit process and barely made, um, got approved and um and i thought we were like i thought we were doing so good already i was like oh we're gonna kill this and then i we took the test and i was like whoa we've got a lot of work to do so um you can use that model without getting certified you can still use it as a model for building income All right, section seven then is easy meat and egg production. Looking at the easiest ways of producing uh, producing uh, farm animals, livestock on your property. Um, we've done chickens, ducks, and rabbits. I, I had some goats way before I actually had a homestead and they were tough, buddy. They they got into everything. But um, you can utilize livestock for a lot of other purposes besides just meat and eggs. You can use use them for uh, pest management. You have a lot of value added products like uh, manures, and um, you can do uh, invasive species management with especially with goats um building soil and um, improving your your land overall if you manage it correctly but if you want to get started get a little chicken tractor and uh, start get half a dozen chickens and um just start raising some birds and getting some eggs and uh, learning that's pretty actually this picture right here in the back this this was our first chicken coop um, my ex-wife and i built that 14 years ago and it still stands today and uh we probably made it for it was made out of scrap materials we probably spent i don't know 20 bucks making it and that's what we raised our first chickens in and as you expand uh you might want to consider a guardian animals we ended up uh, getting a border collie which was just awesome he's still still with us today he's getting old but uh mr malcolm and uh he's added a lot of a lot of fun for our guests too on airbnb you can get other uh, guardian animals too besides dogs uh, and then getting the proper fencing for longevity spending time you know spending a little bit more money up front to Invest in good fencing uh, will pay itself off with dividends. And then uh, we also, in this section, we'll try to take a, a brief look at some larger uh, farm animals, livestock, which I don't have experience personally with um, cows. I used to have horses long ago, but I don't have a lot of experience with that stuff. So um, those are things we will bring in other instructors on later to teach those aspects. Oh, and on the chickens too, real quick, I had some chickens that were um, not very resilient and uh, they ended up getting diseases and they ended up dying out. And, you know, I, I was really stressed about it at first. You know, I hate, I hate to see any animals suffering, um, but after they, you know, after they, died out i mean they they would get eaten like they'd get they'd be the first ones if, a, if there was a predator come in they'd be the first ones to get eaten and uh, they were really pretty but they were high maintenance and these are the birds that are resilient here and these guys actually sleep up in the tree they're protected they protect themselves from predators um and you know every once in a while we'll get something that comes in and climbs up in the tree and, and eats a bird uh, but it's very rare now. So, get the yeah, I was going to say, um, Eric was saying ducks are messy and that he heard pigs were great for tilling the soil. 
And Christine said she loves chickens, but they seem to attract mice and rats. And she didn't know if she had any suggestions. Um, well, for, yeah, so, uh, yeah, pigs are great for tilling the soil, um, but they will, they will till the soil. Like, if you don't want it to be tilled, too bad. Um, so, you know, you can move, if you have pigs, you can move them in. Now, so a lot of, um, some people will have a pig, but a lot of times when getting livestock, it's good to have two, you know, good to have a companionship. Um, so you can rotate them appropriately. If you have that, you know, if you have the space and land, um, Greg Judy is a, a great author that does, it talks about, uh, What's the word? Uh, there's a word that's blanking me now, but he, he basically has all of his livestock in one, um, goes around together, and they all serve a different function. Some people rotate between, um, they'll put cows out, and the cows mow the grass, and then leave big cow patties. A couple of days later, they'll put chickens, and the chickens come in, and they spread out the cow manure, eating the insects out of it, and they spread it out by nature of kicking and then um bring in pigs and the pigs loosen everything up and um and then they let the grass regenerate and they do it again you know that's rotational grazing that's something that we learn about in the permaculture design certification yeah i have friends over here that they have the little electric fence that goes around and there's just a pig in this little area of their yard but it's kept in the and they move that electric fence every few weeks a different part and move the pig so that it slowly has leveled out the land that they mm -hmm. wanted and they don't have a stuck house with the pig with a mess with like having to worry about the the land below it like and and what building in it it's that pig just rotates around the property um it's kind of interesting i never thought of that before um we had a friend before tell us we needed to get a pig to keep in the chicken coop so that it would eat all the the the, the the chicken droppings and duck droppings. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I don't, I'm not expanding to that, but interesting thought, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I learned, I had a couple of chickens die that were frail, like a certain breed. And I was like, all right, not doing that again. And our ducks, we have two Pekins. And we're like, even my daughter's like, no, not doing Pekins again, because they just have leg issues or they're loud and they're just, you know, versus the other ducks. And I was like, all right, not doing that one again. So you yeah. learn these things as you go. Yeah, yeah, the ducks are really, uh, they're really clumsy. If they get out, you know, they will trample stuff. And um, our duck, I have muscovies and um, uh, mallards, and the mallards are so loud. Um, so I'm gonna have some mallard jerky here before too long. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, and then the Muscovies are, I just have this big Drake. He's huge. And he's like, a, it sounds like a helicopter when he's taken off, but it's kind of cool. But at the same time, it's like, I'm just feeding this massive duck. That's really not, he's fully grown. He's not producing anything except for, it's fun to watch him fly sometimes, but you know, there's, you can optimize the meat production to where you're not feeding, you know, you grow them out and then, and then, mm -hmm harvest them slaughter them and then you have you know optimized but i've been i've been feeding fully grown birds for a while that aren't producing a lot but they do you know they do produce a lot of manure and, and that we have it set up to where it slowly washes down through the food forest so it's passively irrigating our food forest um and yes you can get some uh some mice and some you know some critters that will come in and um there, there are things that you can integrate there as well um, to help reduce that. But sometimes those problems that we end up seeing can there's a way to um, there's a way to to integrate something that's actually part of the solution. And there's a documentary called The Biggest Little Farm. Anybody seen that? I don't know. I'll check that out. The biggest little farm. It describes the whole permaculture process and what it looks like over a seven-year period, and it can be really stressful at first. 
And but then by the time year seven rolls around, you kind of get this balance that occurs and all this ecosystem that's developed, and then it starts to um, it starts to flow. It's really cool. All right, so two more, three more sections, real quick. Energy production, depending on where you are in the world, would be uh, what is appropriate. But what we're essentially trying to do here is create renewable energy using current sunlight. We have ancient sunlight, which is energy that's uh, been accumulated in the earth over millions of years. And then we have current sunlight that is uh, wind, hydroelectric, biofuel, geothermal, uh, tidal power, uh, um, methane production. So in the upstate of South Carolina, solar is a good option. Wind is not the greatest because it's not reliable. Geothermal is useful just about anywhere in the world, but it's often best uh, best to just build into the earth if you can. And then um, utilizing thermal mass, which is like a battery that holds temperature, such as uh, an earthen bench or um, concrete floor, or maybe even just water, tanks of water stored in your house that they heat up during the day with sunlight. And then when the sun goes down, they emit the heat and help to heat your home through the evening. That's energy production, but it's not. You don't have to spend money on solar panels in order to do it. Um, so you can produce energy with rocks and water, essentially, is what I'm saying. Um, and then methane production. We have one of these at the treehouse, but I think it has a hole in it. Someone gave it to us from Clemson University, and we've tried it um, very lightly, put some, some effort into it. But the uh, they're if you buy a new system or you integrate a new one, uh, you can essentially put animal manure uh, and flush your toilets into a system that creates methane. Now, I, I visited one in Haiti, mm -hmm. at, in Conj, uh, Haiti, at the hospital. And what they had was a... Um, it was all the toilets from the hospital flushed into a, went down into a, basically a septic tank that had a, a uh, diaphragm on top. The diaphragm would expand and it was in the sunlight, so it would get heat and it would get hot. And then there was a pipe that came straight out of the top of it and went straight up to the kitchen. And they used that. So methane is uh, very similar to propane. Uh, it's like one molecule off or something. So uh, you can burn methane and propane interchangeably. And uh, so anything that's propane powered, which could be, I mean, you could have air conditioning, refrigerators, propane powered, you know, but most people have stove tops or heaters, pretty direct application. Uh, and you can just run that off of methane production. It's very easy to make it from. Um, well, there's other gases that can be uh, that will be produced, especially if you're using like chicken manure or uh, human manure. Um, but those there's ways of filtering those gases out, and uh, so that that's something I want to get into coming up in the near future. Uh, any questions before I go to this last? Um, uh, Vestina was just asking, are root cellars a good option? What's that? Are root cellars a good option? Oh, uh, yeah. Root cellars are a great way to, um, that's, that's direct utilization of geothermal cooling right there. Um, um, question for you. I've, I've heard some people that, that don't have deep enough ground or don't have the ability to do that. They have buried old um, refrigerators or old, um, th th right? And they buried them with the lids 
that they've exposed so that they can open or maybe even under a little bit so that they can open that up and they can put their stuff just into that too. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah. I, I've I, well with the refrigerator, not exactly, but like uh, trash cans. You know, burying a trash can, uh -huh. and then you know you pull the lid off and you throw your roots in there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you can use. Uh, I, we used to go camping in uh, Canada, and we would use the uh, the lake as a refrigerator. You know, we would toss our butter and milk, or we'd put it in a bag and throw it on a put it on a rope and throw it in the bottom of the lake, and um, we kept our we go up there for weeks at a time and we keep all of our refrigerated stuff in in the water, you know, so. All right. Oh, very cool. cool. Um, all right. So section nine is building materials. Then if, if we, if you're starting to build or if you're creating your homestead from scratch and you're going to build something, I would highly consider doing natural materials that you can uh, well, one, they can be way more durable, and two, um, you can fix them with stuff straight off your property. So you can't really see it too well in this picture, but in the backdrop of this is an earth bag structure. It's made out of 90% soil from the site and about 9% cement, which is very easily accessible all around the world. And then we have a little bit of plastic and metal in there, about 1% plastic and metal. It is termite proof, fire proof, rot proof, hurricane proof. It will withstand a tornado. It could take a, you could have a tidal wave smash into it. And it's probably not going to move the thing. It's earthquake proof. Did I mention that? Anything that we have fire proof, anything that we have that takes out a modern day home, you can, uh, if you build a structure with stabilized earth or rammed earth, uh, you can defeat that. Now there is a longevity versus ease of construction to consider. Um, we've built most of the houses, you know, in the United States anyways, are built from lightweight stick frame construction and um that's what we built mostly it's you're framing two by fours you can pick up 10 two by fours at a time and lay out an entire wall you know um easy to build you build it small pieces at a time the uh some of the rammed earth stuff you're dealing with earth heavy clay material um so it can be heavy but it, you do it little bits at a time so you might not want to, if you're going to build a temporary, you know, shed or something like that, you might not want to do uh, this structure that's going to last a thousand years. But if you put a lot of thought into it and design into it, you spend some more time building it and then not have to worry about it in the years to come. All right. Two questions on that real quick. Um, Jennifer was asking Cobb, because I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking Cobb is a building material. And then Bustina was asking if there are restrictions on these types of homes. Great questions. So yeah, cob is sand, clay, and straw. With cob, there's no, uh, there's usually no stabilization. So with cob, you you need to make sure it's under a under a roof. A lot of times with cob, you would do like cob walls or cob furniture. It can be really nice earthen material. Um, the straw helps to hold it together. Uh, very fire resistant still, but if it gets wet, it can degrade. So you, you usually have to have that covered with a good roof system. Uh, so cob is a great option as well, as long as it's uh, free from you know rainfall hitting it. It can be better in drier regions. We have um, there are certain types of construction that are better in certain regions. We built a cob oven with the intention to build a roof over it and then we didn't and it degraded and we had to tear it down um i have a friend that does had a cob wall and they even with a two foot overhang the bottom of the wall was degrading a little bit so we like the stabilized earth where you add a little bit of lime concrete or asphalt emulsion to create water resistance uh, or waterproof 
and uh, and it creates a lot higher PSI pounds per square inch, uh, so you can use it as a building block and it doesn't collapse. But cob um, cob would be great, well, a lot better used in our region, which is basically a rainforest. It would be a lot better used inside the house with um, with some dehumidification. Um, and then, oh, so, okay, the international, the IRC, International Residential Code, is the book that's used internationally to build uh, a certified home, essentially. And the IRC is now accepting uh, cob construction in certain aspects, and they're... Um, uh, some RAM, like you can do different types of construction with um, anything that you want to build as long as it's got an engineer stamp of approval. So if you find the right engineer, you can always get a stamp with no matter what you want to build as long as it's a good, you know, you're not going to get an engineer to stamp something that's not going to last. But there are some other ways around it as well, like the earth struck earth bag structure that we built i contacted the uh the only company that um engineers earth bag structures that i could find at the time and they were going to charge me five thousand dollars to engineer this 200 square foot house and so i contacted the earth bag construction um manual author and he said just follow the instructions in the book and you'll be fine and then I contacted the building codes and I said, hey, I want to build this structure. And they said, well, you can build a structure under 400 square feet um, as long as it's a storage building and you're not running any power to it. You don't have to get a permit. So I initially built this as a storage unit and then I let it sit for a couple of years and then made some modifications um, so it could become a dwelling unit. So a lot of, a lot of times, and it's depending on your county, uh, you can build something as an experimental structure. And if it, if it stands for two years, then they can come in and they'll say, okay, well, it's durable enough that it's still standing. Then we can, you know, come in and do a, a light inspection and, uh, make sure it's, you know, not cracked and fallen down. And then you can convert it later. But whenever doing a project like this, I always like to do that assessment first and then get the assessment of you and your property and even looking at your county or your building, like some places have no regulation whatsoever. Like uh, where I'm from in Ohio, I, I still don't think they have a building codes. Like they, they're just like whatever you want to do. So, but take whatever you want to do and call up your, you know, go into the building codes and say, here's what I would like to do. And then they're going to sit down with you and they're going to bring in the planning, DHEC, building codes, and you can ask all your questions and they'll tell you, well, you can do this, but you can't do this. And then a lot of times you can redefine, like I wanted to build a community center. And they said, well, if you call it a community center, you're going to have to get a commercial builder. And I said, well, I want to build it myself. And they said, well, I said, well, what if I just called it the common house and I just make it a, like a residential home? And he's like, oh, he's like, yeah, yeah, just do that. This was the building codes inspector. He's like, yeah, just do that. Just call it a residential home. And he said, when you go to pull the permit, don't say anything about Airbnb, just say residential home. And they shouldn't give you any hassle. And then, and then he went on and he said, hey, off the record, he's like, that earth dome that you built? He's like, how did you do that? Because I want to do one in my backyard. So, so a lot of times the people that are, you know, they're getting paid to follow that international residential code book line by line. So when you ask them a question, they will pull up the code book and they'll say, okay, it says here this. They're just reading the line by line and trying to follow, you know, so they don't get fired. But they're also often quite interested in 
regenerative sustainable solutions. And like, I mean, I've worked with them to create gray water systems that aren't in the code book. Um, we've created gray water systems and just I've designed systems that will work to follow the code, but there's no like approval in the book. They said, well, here's the rules. And I said, okay, with those rules, I'm going to design a system to fit those rules. And then we designed it and I said, okay, we can check off on that. Yeah, I think many times they're tired of it too. Tired <laughs> of this says this and this says that. And it's, you know, if you're going to do something that's going to be fine, I just think that's sometimes how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last, last little bit. Governance. I did call this government, but nobody likes government. So change it to governance. Governance. Um, ah, I should call it. Oh, I'm going to change that to govern A N T S. Govern your ants now. All right. So this is creating systems, uh, documenting every system. So our, you know, we're creating a magic formula to help people master the trades. So govern by uh, creating systems for everything you do so that when you have helpers or you have new people come in, you can say, here's the system. This is how we do it. And constantly accepting feedback and and um, and changing things as needed. I use this backdrop because govern like a system of governance is natural without without gravity. Gravity is a system that governs things. The sun governs our rotation of our planets. Without that, without predators, prey would overrun. You know, we have to have systems in place. So standard operating procedures is another thing. Looking at um, just how things are done. Um, having rules for your people, your guests, etc. Intake forms. Um, human resource management, different kinds. And then automation, like sprinkler systems and automated chicken door openers. Um, I'm actually getting ready to build a chicken coop for a client right now, and we have, we're installing these $200 chicken doors that um, <clears throat> open when it's light out and they close off when it gets dark. So you don't have to go out and worry about running out there. You can automate your feeding systems, automate your watering systems. Um, and then um, constantly accepting feedback too, you know, accepting feedback for things that don't work. And um, as I've learned the hard way to try to be humble so you can, you can uh, learn, I'm constantly learning. So I'd really like after this, I'd, I'd love any feedback that you guys have positive or negative, I actually like negative feedback because um, helps me to get better. So don't, don't hold back on that. And, uh, and then this is an invitation to connect. Um, I don't have any, uh, I'm not currently doing this homesteading simplified course. Uh, I'll be scheduling some things, but if you want to go to treehousetradeschool.com slash events, we have uh, free events coming up. The uh, Treehouse Trade School Vision Awakening event is Thursday, February 22nd at 6 o'clock p.m. in Easley at my friend's brewery. If you do, if you want to join, but you can't be there, you can RSVP anyways, and I will uh, send you a Zoom link, and we'll do the same kind of thing. Uh, but we're developing a school at the center of a community, inviting other people to come and uh, do business at that school and possibly live in the community. Uh, really just working to create a model for a new way of school schooling that can um, be a lot of hands-on learning opportunities for all ages. And uh, this is the thing I will be working on until it's done. Could be 10 years, could be the rest of my life. Um, 
the goal is to create a legacy so it will last forever, well beyond my children. We also have some hands-on training courses available. We will have more online courses available soon. And if you're local, we have an open house every first Saturday of the month. You can come out and visit us at the Seneca Treehouse Project. We're usually working on something. And uh, we love to work with people and hang out. We have a potluck. My boys are usually, well, my boys are there every first Saturday. Um, they love having other kids to play with. So um, we just really want to be a service to the community in any way possible. And, you know, if, I always tell people, if you don't have, you don't have any money or any resources and you, you just need some help, like if you send me a question, I will make every effort to create a video on that question and post it online for free and tag you in it or whatever uh, to That'll help help us to create content and uh, hopefully help help you as well. So thank you thank so you. much, guys. Thank, thank you, you very much, Scott. Me. Um, I have so CO posted in here. She's um they said thank you for thank you all for organizing this session as I'm learning a lot, especially the information presented is mostly on how to go with things in simple, realistic ways. Plus the links really help. Please bear with me as I have more questions as follows. I've just started reading Richard Perkins' book on regenerative agra and would appreciate it if you could briefly share how regenerative approach is different from Bill Mollison's idea of permaculture. Just want to get a gist. Thank you. Two, would appreciate it if you could recommend practical books for beginners who want to start raising chickens and those who want to start beekeeping as livestock. And then three, I know I need to learn more about woodworking or carpentry stuff. Can you recommend a practical book to start with? So my my follow up to this is, is this something that is better if they email you, like you were just saying, um, and then it's something you could, you might want to do a video on and that helps build, I know I've tried to do this video library as well for uh, the other work that I do. Um, um, uh, yeah, feel free to email me any questions. I think uh, that because I'm thinking that might be a lot to answer right now, and we're about an hour and a half in, and I'm just thinking yeah. you might want to email you. What was then go to treehousetradeschool.com and get your email from there. Yeah, treehousetradeschool at gmail dot com. Um, yeah, or you can go to that. If right now we have two websites up, I'm gonna. So if you Google Treehouse Trade School, it'll take you to our old website. But so if you type in treehousetradeschool.com, it'll take you to our new one, which I still don't have complete, but it's a lot of the stuff's up there. So that's the most up-to-date. Just to answer that question, um, regenerative ag is, permaculture is like an overarching uh, thing that includes regenerative agriculture, sustainable building, and a lot of other different things. Um, so permaculture is regenerative agriculture. And just real quick, a book, Creating Your Backyard Farm, is a book that, um, I forget the author now, I'm terrible at that. She actually sent me a couple of free books, so I should know her name. I think it's Lauren or Laura or something. But that's been a really helpful book for uh, getting started. Okay, very good. And I think they'll email you. All right, Eric had to leave. Um, yeah, and see if you could email him, that'd be great. All right, so I think, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I was quite informative and I learned quite a bit. Um, I, I, You know what? I planned probably this afternoon to go out and go pull some of the weeds and clean up the garden the, the winter garden and get it ready so now i'm like oh now i'm eager to go out and actually go do that and go like straighten stuff up and go here i'm like yes now i'm eager to go do, get that done um so i just want to show that i plan volunteer or work in a farmer run csa because i like the idea of community-based collaboration which i think will be more resilient in the future like what you guys are promoting and i totally agree hope to get in touch with you guys later even i've recognized that like i've traded eggs for things you know, I've I've done things because I've realized there's no way you could actually 
we are all built differently with different talents and different uniquenesses that it helps if we can learn to work together. Like I can have chickens and eggs and somebody else can grow squash and somebody else can do this and that, you know, and somebody else bakes bread. Something I would love to be break, baking bread and doing that sourdough thing, but I'm like the work and the time, you know, I'll trade you eggs for sourdough, you know, and I'm like you know, learning how to work together. And I think bartering, we've built a shop. Um, we have a mechanic shop over here and we've built a bigger one. And there's been times that, some an old farmer need, needs something done on their tractor and they've got metal. So we'll trade metal for labor, for building stuff. And learning how to do that is really valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's something that they learned to do many years ago and then it died off and stopped. So, yeah. you know, learning that kind of stuff is really valuable. All right. So any other last questions or thoughts otherwise? We can go ahead and wrap it up. All right. I'll go Thank ahead and stop.